There we Hello, go. Everybody. Hello, everybody, and welcome to our latest Hubble Hangout. My name is Tony Darnell. I work at the Space Telescope Science Institute, and today we have a really interesting hangout planned for you. We're going to be talking with Dr. Laurent Lamy from the University of Paris in Moudon about planetary aurorae, auroras, aurorae. One, one of those three are right. I'm not sure which one, but they all sound wrong. Um, so, we'll be so we hope that you will interact with us and talk about all things planetary aurora today. Uh, before I get to the introductions, let me just say very briefly that you, we hope you will interact with us. You will give us comments and questions where you can do it in a wide variety of ways. The Q&A app is the best way to do it. You can see that on both Google and YouTube. So you just click on that thing and type in a question, and it will appear magically uh, onto our little panel here, and I'll be able to see the question. You can also tweet at us with Hubble hashtag or Hubble Hangout Hubble. hashtag. Dang it. Three times. One week I'm going to get that right without stumbling. <laughs> <laughs> as well as all, you can also comment on YouTube and the Google Plus event page where this is being broadcast, so we hope you'll do it. Uh, please leave us questions and comments about anything related to Hubble, and we'll try to get to them as well. So with me this week, as I said before, uh, is uh, Dr. Laurent Lamy from the University of Paris in Moudon. He studies auroras, and he's with us today to give us, he's been using the Hubble Space Telescope to look not at the ones within our own planet, but ones within our solar system. So welcome, Laurent. Was looking forward to talking with you. Also with me, as 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 always, are my very good friends, Dr. Carol Christian from the Space Telescope Science Institute. She is a uh, she's an astronomer here, and uh, wonderful wonderful insights and great great uh, feedback from and information from Hubble, as well as my good friend Scott Lewis from KnowTheCosmos.com, and he's here to also help out. So welcome everybody. Let's get started. First of all, what's the appropriate? What's the right way to say the plural of aurora? Oh, that's not <laughs> question. Since I seem to struggle with that, yeah, so. it, was, it was not planetal. Actually, uh, I'm personally using aurorae uh, because aurora. that's the okay. Latinian form, and I think auroras is the U.S. Uh, translation of that. But feel free to use uh, the word you prefer. They all sound wrong to me. So whichever one. So I prefer. I'm going to use auroras just because. It, Sounds better, I guess. So, uh, Laurent, better, go ahead. Better in that case is to speak about oral emissions so that you cover all these uh, curious emissions uh, as a bunch and you do not have to think about the oral right word to use. There you go. I like that. All right. Well, the good, good advice. Okay. So, let's talk about, so let's talk a little bit about the general topic of, of these auroral emissions, as you call them. Uh, we, we see them here on Earth. Uh, they, they, as you are going to show us, they, we've well, seen them on other planets. Are they? So, what, what? Can you give me the most general definition of what these things are? What is this phenomenon? Uh, that's a, that's a good way to begin with, since uh, people do not generally agree on uh, how what to call aurora these days. But historically, uh, oral emissions refer to these uh, uh, intense lights that were seen uh, on Earth's atmosphere for decades in the visible uh, uh, light, visible domain. So um, this remains then uh, as, um, I mean, uh, these categories of uh, uh, luminous emissions from the atmosphere. And then uh, with the, the study of the other planets, and, and I mean, the study of oral processes from space, we discovered ORI also above the atmosphere. And so now we are more generally speaking about oral emissions, uh, which consists actually in a series of uh, different uh, emission processes. So both in the atmosphere and uh, above the atmosphere in the surrounding env environment of the magnetized planets. In the atmosphere and above the atmosphere. So exactly. So what? But that doesn't. That is, I still don't get it. What are they? Wh what is causing these emissions? J is it is it different depending on the planet? Is that why we can't get more specific than that? Or uh, we could say that we have uh, the same series of uh, uh, production processes which exist at all planets, but the species which are excited, the atmospheric species in particular, uh, may be different. So, uh, for instance, uh, on Earth, the visible lights we see in the sky come uh, directly from the collision. Uh, between uh, uh, charged particles, which come from the, the neighborhood of the Earth, and which uh, collide with the neutral atmosphere. So the neutral atmosphere acts as a screen where uh, energetic particles uh, fall down. Actually, we say that they precipitate, and they transfer energy, which is then re-radiated by uh, the atmosphere. 
Thus, the, the light we see, the, the wavelength domain uh, they consist of, depend on the atmospheric composition. And at Earth, the most radiative species are nitrogen and oxygen, which are able to radiate in the visible domain, essentially. And so, so with I, I have a question. So, do you need, in, on every planet in the solar system, do you need a magnetic field to get those charged particles, or can you have aurora without magnetic fields? So, generally speaking, uh, oral processes are actually only seen on uh, magnetized planets. So, to have, uh, to generate these particles, which uh, at the end will uh, excite the atmosphere, you need a, a, a magnetic field, uh, which um, then produces what we call a magnetosphere. So, uh, I think, Tony, if, uh, Scott, if you agree to to show uh, the first uh, picture with magnetospheres can show a, a graphics where you have a, a, a schematics of the solar system with various magnetized planets. Um, these. Uh, okay, Scott has it up now. Ah, okay. So, uh, so basically, uh, um, a magnetic field is creating in the the neighborhood of the the planet. A cavity, which we call a magnetosphere, and this is this cavity which has the ability, via complex phenomena, to uh, um, accelerate charged particles, which, which then will be guided along magnetic field line uh, down to the polar region where they can collide with the neutral atmosphere. So we're sticking with Earth just for a minute before we go off to these other planets for a second. We have, obviously we have a magnetic field. The, the particles are coming from the sun, charged particles from the sun, presumably electrons from the solar wind coming in, following the magnetic field down, and as you say, hit these neutral particles high in the atmosphere primarily, nitrogen and oxygen, since that's what the uh, Earth is made, the Earth's atmosphere is primarily made of, and they glow, they emit this light, which is generally on Earth green, right? Greenish. Green, green, and the reason for that? Yeah, the, the reason for that? Ah, the reason for that is uh, due to um, uh, quantum physics, uh, which which means that uh, when you have a molecule or uh, an atom, it's able to radiate in a specific series of transition, which produce light. So actually, uh, the Earth's oral emissions in the atmosphere are not simply green. Uh, nor red, nor only purple. I know, uh, that was an oversimplification, uh, but they're uh, mostly green. <laughs> okay, they cover a wide spectrum with a few very intense lines which give uh, the impression that these emissions are very colored in a very, uh, very specific uh, transitions. Okay, so but other... Uh, let so me... Oh, sorry. go ahead. Uh, I would like just to, uh, to come back on, on something that you say quickly. Uh, actually, the charged particles we are uh, dealing with are not di directly coming uh, from the sun, or more uh, uh, specifically from the solar wind. Actually, this cavity, which is uh, produced by a magnetic field, a planetary magnetic field, is uh, at first order deviating the solar wind on the edges of that cavity. So that, uh, at first order, this is uh, plasma proof, we may say. The, the particles of the solar wind cannot penetrate into the magnetosphere. So those charged particles, under some complex phenomena, uh, may be able to enter in some way, uh, because uh, this is not always uh, plasma proof, but uh, these particles, before to produce aura, have to be sort of uh, uh, reprocessed by the magnetosphere, which will uh, accelerate them, transfer energy to them, before they will be able to, to emit auras. So the link between solar wind and the lights we see in the atmosphere is not direct. I don't understand. So you're telling me that, that the, 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 the particles from the solar wind are following the field lines, and if you look at what Scott has up, those field lines are shown in those yellow lines there. What we actually see emitted by the time we see the light is not due to the solar wind particles? So, um, if you want to understand this simply, we can just uh, consider the fact that the, the charged particles which are uh, carried by the solar wind are not energetic enough to produce oral emissions, right? This is the first point, so we, okay. we, need, we need something to, to, uh, to, to transfer energy to these particles because they can be good candidates to produce these emissions. This is the first point. The second point is that at Earth, uh, oral emissions are mostly produced on the night side of the planet. So the night side means that you are not facing the sun. 
So there cannot be a direct link between these particles which are coming from the sun and the, the, these powerful emissions which are seen on the night side of the planet. So I was simply uh, saying that these particles which are arriving with the sol which are transported by solar wind um, are not directly responsible for the emissions we see. They need first to enter into the magnetosphere under some complex uh, conditions and then to be reprocessed, to be warmed, to be accelerated before they can then give rise to uh, oral emissions on the night side of the planet. Got it. Okay, so the key word where was was accelerated. It seems to me like you need to get these particles more energy than what they would have out in. Uh, right. before the, I right. get it now. Okay, uh, but I'm. I, are you sure they don't happen during the day because and we just can't see them, or they really don't happen during the day? Uh, the situation is always uh, less simplistic than that <laughs> we are trying to explain. So uh, I was referring to intense or I. Uh, which are seen on the night side of the Earth. Of course, uh, they are already all around uh, both magnetic poles, and so that's why we are uh, speaking about polar aurorae and not simply uh, borealis, uh, aurorae borealis, because borealis just refers to the northern hemisphere, and there are also aurorae in the southern hemisphere, so Australis uh, aurorae. Okay. Uh, and so they are aurorae all around these, uh, um, these uh, magnetic poles, forming what we call uh, oral ovals. But the ovals, the oral ovals themselves, which are centered on magnetic poles, are more intense on the night side. So you have a faint aurorae on the, on the day side, the issue is that as these emissions are very faint, uh, we are generally not able to see them because the contrast is too faint on the on the day side to catch them in the sky. Okay, Carol, I think I cut you off when you were trying to say something. Did you want to uh, put add to this? No, 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 no. Uh, Laurent explained it that the the solar wind particles can then interact with stuff in the magnetosphere, which then can cascade and and interact with the atmosphere. So there can be a transition zone. Um, and acceleration was one of the keys, is that they have to accelerate to, and the magnetic field helps with that. Okay, well, I, I, think, uh, I think we've established what these things are in a general sense. Laurent, let me ask you this now. What is your, what, what got you into this? What is your research interest in, uh, in, in, in studying these things on uh, other planets? What got you going on this? So uh, my purpose of interest is to try to uh, take advantage, take benefit of these oral emissions, which can be sensed remotely by uh, telescopes, as Hubble, for instance, uh, to uh, diagnose, to study uh, planetary magnetospheres. Because generally speaking, uh, a magnetic field cannot be uh, studied over than uh, in situ with uh, special uh, measurements. Uh, that can be done with uh, spacecraft uh, exploring the various planets of the solar system. But uh, when we do not have the possibility to send spacecraft around a magnetized planet, um, oral emissions remain a useful and powerful tool to investigate remotely the physics of uh, this magnetosphere. So my purpose is to try to, uh, to take advantage of these emissions, to, uh, to take uh, all the information that they carried on, and then to uh, explain the, the, the physics of the magnetosphere they are able to, to, uh, to diagnose. And, you, and you're primarily, and you've been using the Hubble Space Telescope for a lot of this, correct? Yes, that's correct, because uh, as for the outer planets, so uh, the planets beyond the orbit of the Earth, uh, the composition of the atmosphere is, uh, uh, as for the giant planets, generally dominated by uh, hydrogenic species. So. Uh, the atmosphere comp atmospheric composition is different from that from the Earth, and uh, this uh, atmospheric composition has the ability, has the capability to radiate in the UV uh, window uh, that Hubble is particularly uh, uh, able to, to look at. So Hubble is a, a very powerful tool to look at the aura of uh, other planets uh, than the Earth. You know, you know, Carol. One of the things I'm noticing in these hangouts lately is that an awful lot of people are using the UV capabilities of Hubble. Uh, you know, the last few hangouts we've had, we've we've talked about this. That's been a really important part of people using the Hubble. I guess I always looked at it as more of an infrared instrument, but you know, we have a lot of people using the UV as well. So yeah, and I think I think what started was, of course because we have a lot of experience in ground-based astronomy, we started with kind of the visual. So we do a lot of the things that we know in the visual and then pushed into the infrared. But the UV capability and the fact that we got new instruments um, that, that 
assisted with that capability has really been powerful. And when Hubble no longer is working, we have no other UV capability in space, and we can't get the UV on the ground. So right now it is a why, UV why is resource. That? It's called money. <laughs> uh, <laughs> on the ground, we can't see the UV very far into the UV. Yeah, that's because, what I was saying. <laughs> because, I know, I know, I know. I was being facetious. Um, on the ground, we can't see because the atmosphere happily blocks it so that we're not all fried. It is a good thing. Uh, I'm glad you mentioned that. It's a good that. thing. The visual comes through a little bit of the infrared in certain places, but the water vapor helps block the infrared and some of the radio as well. Um, so we need telescopes in space, and Hubble right now is the one that has UV capability. It may be that after 2020, there might be another telescope proposed to NASA that will have some UV capability, but you're right, the people are really looking to the UV to use Hubble in the UV um, because you need to know a lot of these phenomena that you can't see in the visible or the infrared. So it is an important aspect. Yeah, it's an important wavelength. One that I'm just now starting to appreciate with Hubble because of the recent hangouts we've had. Not to mention this one and as well as the the uh, ultra deep field which just added UV as well. So, okay, so well, you I oh. had sorry to interrupt. No. I had two I had two two questions. One is when did astronomers first realize that the other planets had a role? Is this one of these things we always knew, but we didn't, you know, or we didn't suspect it, or we just didn't ever observe it, or, or when did the, this interest in other planet aurora start? And the second question is, do the colors on other planets tell you anything about the composition? So as for the first question, uh, we uh, um, spoke um, since the beginning of that hangout about uh, visible emission uh, in the atmosphere, starting with the Earth. Actually, there are also uh, oral emissions which are produced above the atmosphere. We quickly mentioned them at the beginning, uh, which are actually radio emission. So uh, atmospheric emissions are produced by, we said, precipitating charged particles, essentially electrons. And these electrons, when guided by magnetic field line down to the atmosphere, have the possibility to, uh, to, to drive a resonance instability to produce radio waves. So radio emissions are also of oral nature, and they are found uh, around all magnetized planets of the solar system. So back to your question, the first time we, we found aurora on another planet than Earth was thanks to uh, radio observations from the ground with radio telescopes uh, based in the U.S., and uh, discovering the uh, decametric emission of Jupiter. And actually, this was the first proof that Jupiter possesses a magnetic, uh, an internal magnetic field. And then, uh, um, with the space exploration, uh, thanks to the Voyager uh, spacecraft, which explored the four giant planets uh, in, the in, the, in the 80s, mainly, 70s, 80s, uh, we had the possibility to look in situ with uh, small telescopes on board uh, the Voyager spacecraft, and in particular a UV spectrometer, which was able to identify oral emissions uh, at all these planets, so Jupiter, Saturn uh, in order, Uranus, and Neptune. Uh, Laurent, before you go any further, I just want to interrupt real quick and say Scott's got a pretty picture up uh, so that we can uh, emphasize that. Uh, what are we looking at here? So this picture is a... Uh, sort of a collage of uh, UV observations acquired by the Hubble Space Telescope uh, for the three uh, giant systems, uh, which are the those of Jupiter, Saturn, and Uranus, and showing, uh, basically, the, the emissions which can be seen in the UV window. So on these, um, on these uh, figures, uh, you show the planets, and sometimes the satellites that have been caught uh, by, by, the, by HST um, as well, and um, you see that there are different sort of emissions. Uh, the solar light is reflected uh, generally by the atmosphere of these bodies. So this is why uh, the planet or the satellites are uh, bluish uh, all over their, their surface. And in addition to this, uh, you see bright emissions, which are the aura we are speaking uh, since the beginning of this, uh, this talk, uh, which are these powerful emissions, you see very white, and which are very localized. So we see at Earth that um, these emissions are distributed along two main so-called oral ovals, so say two circles cent centered around magnetic poles. And you can see here that uh, 
looking at a specific planet, for instance, Jupiter, the situation is uh, both similar. You see a novel, which is likely centered on, on the southern magnetic pole here, but also different. The, the, the phenology is much more complex and variable than at Earth. And this can be transposed to, to the other planets as well. So I'm noticing with this image here that Io seems to have aurora as well, auroral emissions. Is that what I'm seeing there in this image? Uh, which one? Io? The moon? Io? What is? Yeah. So, so Io is a, an example of aurora that we, which can be found on a satellite uh, because um, we briefly say that uh, such lights are produced when there is a, a beam of uh, energetic particles which collide with a neutral uh, uh, medium, say an atmosphere. And so as these uh, uh, satellites, um, say Io, Ganymede, or uh, um, uh, Europa, uh, possesses an exosphere or at least a surface where this can, particle can uh, with which this can, particle can collide, uh, this witnesses uh, the, 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 arrival, the arrival of uh, beams of charged particles. So these materialize uh, auras, auras of satellites. Hmm. And so, and Titan there right next to it looks pretty quiet to me. Does that mean not so much, or what? what is that? Titan was uh, put there because it was observed, but uh, no oral emissions were, were detected on that satellite because... Okay. It, it's not very well um, coupled in uh, electrodynamic uh, term to uh, his planet, contrary to Io with Jupiter. And just to come back to the second question of Carol, uh, what may we uh, um, infer with these emissions about the atmospheric compositions, atmospheric composition of these bodies? Uh, as for the atmosphere of giant planets, uh, Jupiter, Saturn, uh, Uranus, we know that the atmosphere is dominated by hydrogenic species. So this has been shown with a spectroscopic observations of Hubble, in particular, that uh, we are facing emissions, uh, oral emissions, are uh, reflecting um, uh, H and H2, mainly, uh, species. So this is a diagnosis of the, the, the atmospheric composition. As for Io, the situation is quite different because, because Io is uh, uh, emitting um, uh, is uh, possessing uh, an exosphere which is made uh, of different uh, atmospheric species, exospheric species, and mainly dominated by oxygen. So on the image of Io, what you see, the aurora that you see, are produced by uh, oxygen. So the UV window is able to, uh, to, to pick up specific transitions which, are, which can uh, come from either uh, hydrogen for the atmosphere of giant planets, either oxygen or the dioxygen for, for their satellites. So we all know that Io is a pretty um, active place uh, geologically and with you know lots of activity going on there and the reason that you're confident these are auroral emissions happens to be the, the fact that they're so bright in the UV then, correct? And not something else that might be going on with, with Io. Yes, they are bright, they are localized, they are transient, so these are properties of auroral emissions. This cannot be uh, something due to the, the, the the reflected sunlight, for instance, because it, oh. it would affect the whole uh, uh, um, enlightened face of the satellite. Okay, I have a really relate, a really good related question from Patrick Calhoun on the Q and A app, who is going. Do you think a planetary filter will ever be made someday for us to see the aurora from Earth? A planetary filter? Yeah, I guess. I guess the question is, should we see? Would we be able to observe planetary? Aurora from Hubble of the Earth? Uh, I think this has been done not by Hubble but by another X-ray telescope uh, orbiting Earth, uh, pointing to the night side of the Earth and tracking uh, X-ray emission. But I don't think Hubble tried to do that because of the risk to, to point uh, the Sun in the field of view and then to, to damage the instruments. But Carol, you may correct me. No, that's right. We can't point at the Earth. And in fact, when Hubble goes or as the Hubble goes around the Earth, we have to make sure we're not pointing towards it because it's too bright. And so we can't make any observations um, of the Earth. Um, I think there are also, there may have been some Earth-looking, you know, like Landsat and um, GOI and some of those Earth-looking satellites. Certainly the astronauts uh, saw Aurora from yeah, the sure. space shuttle, that's a better and they, they took 
lots of pictures. So yeah, that that's a better platform for. It's observing. a great platform. Yeah. Yeah, the, yeah, the uh, issue with is really the sensitivity and the, the size of the telescope, the primary mirror that uh, the STSCI team does not want to, to damage. And you're right that uh, many spacecraft have taken uh, uh, images of the Earth's aurora from space, and so imaging both uh, auroras on the day side and on the night side. And uh, you're also right by pointing that um, the ISS team, uh, the astronauts on board the ISS uh, uh, station, are uh, continuously taking photographs and making beautiful films that you may find uh, uh, on the internet, and that show uh, actually very well the dynamics of this emission. When we are on the on the on the Earth, we can look at uh, these emissions uh, from very uh, far, actually, and that's the same situation for a telescope which is uh, orbiting the Earth very far. But with the ISS station, uh, the auroras are seen by the edge, actually. So the level of details is really uh, impressive. Yeah, it's a good question. And uh, the Here's way I like a to... web page too for those that want to see the aurora from space. Um, it's for the gateway to astronaut photography of Earth, and so where I use, oh, uh, nice. when I've made some of my compilation videos, I use a lot of the source material here, which are from the time-lapse photography that are done by the astronauts from the International Space Station. Uh, I, I'll put it into the Google Plus event, and I'll tweet it out there, but for those, and actually I'll put in a comment on YouTube too, but it's EOL dot jsc dot nasa dot gov and you're you're able to go through and actually get all the full resolution images if you want them or also see them in a movie file yeah. for the time lapse. The ISS is probably one of the best spots to try and see some of these activities. So that's that's good. Thanks, Scott. Yeah. Okay, so we've we've basically what I want to know though, uh, Laurent is okay. So you've been looking at these observe the uh, these uh, um, aurora from all different planets and using the Hubble, you've gotten some, gotten some good data. Uh, what have been the greatest, what's been your biggest surprise uh, in observing? Has there been a planet that was unusually more active than you thought, brighter than you thought? Do you have, has anything really really surprised you in your research? You mean myself or the community in general? What were well, the main... Uh... I guess both. I guess both. So, I mean, I, I, looking at these aurora, what were, you, what were you expecting versus what did you find? Uh, if we take the case of Jupiter, for instance, uh, so Scott, maybe you may may display the um, the composite figure of Jupiter made made of um, other images taken in the UV and in the visible range. You see uh, these uh, two uh, uh, ovals uh, centered around magnetic poles, right? He has it up now. Okay, and when uh, uh, the obs UV observers uh, look at these images first. They identified um, that strange spot that you see uh, both in the northern and in the southern hemisphere. Do you see it? It's equator ward of the main oval. It's a bright mm -hmm. spot with sort of a wake, right? Yeah, right, right below the. Yeah, it's on both sides, isn't it? On both poles. Yes, that's on both on both on both sides. And actually, uh, people then realized that uh, this was uh, this spot was related to the magnetic flux tube, which was connecting to the satellite Io. And so uh, that was a surprise. Wow. Let me wow. say that again to make sure it was yeah, understood. Yeah, yeah, wow. So this the magnetic spot, flux tube. The, you said it was the magnetic flux tube associated with Io, right? Exactly. And so uh, there are other spots uh, which may be seen on the following picture, if Scott can display it, uh, which are associated with other Galilean satellites um, at Jupiter. So uh, the fact that we get a spot at the footprint, so we call it a footprint of a magnetic field connected to a satellite is uh, saying us something. And the most uh, enthusiastic uh, discovery was to realize that there was a sort of a coupling between the satellite and the planet able to uh, accelerate particle enough to produce uh, such bright footprints at the foot of the field lines connecting uh, the satellite to, to the planet. So this was a major discovery, actually. And when you look at, uh, at, uh, at this picture of Jupiter, with the main oval and some specific uh, polar emission, you clearly see different spots which are materiali materializing the different Galilean satellites of Jupiter. And, and which, which is that? Scott doesn't have it up right now. I'm, I'm trying to... Yes, I see it. It says the main oval and it has... Yeah, Scott has it up and it shows oh. Io and um, Europa and Ganymede. Oh, and so is. there are little dots that, that then connect the, tu the tube lines. So, so, I mean, what Lauren is saying, if I can put words in his mouth, is that Jupiter is an amazing environment because the, you know, 
some of those satellites, those moons, have atmospheres as well, and, and Jupiter really interacts with some of the main moons, its main moons, and so there's this communication that goes on between Jupiter and the moons through these magnetic field lines, and so they share this aurora phenomenon. Exactly. A, I'm sorry, go ahead, finish. Exactly, and uh, um, this connection is of electric nature because we have an exchange of uh, charged particles, so uh, this means currents. Uh, and just to finish with, if we take that picture of Jupiter, uh, if we now uh, exclude satellites, you see that you also have a main overall together with polar emissions, and altogether we can say that when we look at a specific, uh, uh, at, at all emissions of a specific planet, each um, uh, part of this complex uh, morphology says something to us uh, in terms of uh, magnetospheric physics. I mean, to produce this bright emission, you need to have an active region somewhere in the magnetosphere, and each uh, bright spot or ovals or transient uh, phenomena uh, refer to something happening transiently or not in the magnetosphere. Is there any relationship or connection between the, the size of the planet and the strength of these aurora? Like, does Jupiter have more powerful, more bright aurora than, than uh, other smaller planets, or is that, a, is that related in any way? Uh, yes, Jupiter is the most powerful uh, aural emitter of the solar system. Uh, these emissions that we see in these pictures are generally uh, two to three orders of magnitude more intense in terms of emitted power with respect to uh, uh, these of the Earth, for instance. Um, Saturn is only uh, one order of magnitude brighter with respect to the Earth. But then, so, what is the reason? What is the reason for this brightness? You will ask, right? Yep. Yeah, well, okay. Yep. I was going to go there. Okay. And uh, and we, to our under current understanding, there are two main phenomena that trigger the, the strength of these oral phenomena. The first is the, the interaction with the solar wind. The interaction between solar wind and the Earth's magnetic field is the primary uh, 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 generator for uh, Earth's aura. And Jupiter is the other extremal case, uh, as Jupiter is not very sensitive to solar wind at all. It uh, possesses a very strong magnetic field, so it's not very sensitive to solar wind. And these bright emissions are essentially internally triggered by the rapid rotation of the planet. So the solar wind effect and the effect of the planetary rotation are the two main drivers for, uh, responsible for the brightness of these emissions. So if you had a small planet that rotated very fast and had a very bright or very strong magnetic field for whatever reason, you would get equally bright uh, or at least very bright auroral emissions from that situation. Exactly, exactly. And uh, we can we can quote the case of Mercury, which it, which has a very weak magnetic field, but which is located very close to the Sun. And so there, the solar wind acts as the primary uh, driver for auroral emissions. And as Mercury is even weakly magnetized, it displays uh, oral emissions as well. Oh, I didn't know that. Wow. Well, what about, okay, so let's talk about that. Mars, for example, has, as far as I know, no magnetic field, correct? It doesn't have much of a dynamo at all. Uh, no. So right. nothing, right, from Mars? It would. It... More or less, the question is open. Mars does possess a, a, what, we say, what we call a crustal magnetic field. So this is not permanent. What, I'm sorry, it's excuse not... me, a what magnetic field? A crystal magnetic field. Crystal, which means that... Oh, crystal. Uh, Mars, right. I just want to make sure I understood, yeah. because... Uh, yeah. Okay, Chris, Mars I'm sorry. Was used, Mars was certainly used in the past to possess a permanent magnetic field, uh, like uh, those of the other planets, but it disappeared, and we only have uh, traces of, uh, of it now, uh, which is uh, called a uh, crystal magnetic field. And in the neighborhood of uh, these traces of uh, past magnetic field, there have been some attempts to, uh, to, to detect oral emissions, but this is not obvious at all. And then to finish with Venus, Venus okay. does, not, does not possess any magnetic field at all, so Venus does not possess, possess any uh, permanent magnetosphere, nor uh, oral emissions. So I'm still trying to get my head around the crystal magnetic field, but, I, it, but there is something there that's causing some... some uh, Magnetic interaction in some way. I should point out that you have two small children in the background who are. Uh, no, it was just me. Oh, that, no, that's God. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. The yeah. internet's being mean to me today. Yeah, I'm sorry. 
<laughs> yeah, Scott needs to... Okay. Just, he's late for us here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. It is six hours. Well, uh, okay, so um, the so you, you, you've, you found that these, uh, these satellite interactions were a surprise. These were something you didn't expect to see uh, when you yeah. began your research. Is there, what's the future? Where are you going to head for here? What's, uh, what's in store for you next? So um, these satellites were an example of what surprised not only me, but the community. Um, right. Most recently, I've worked uh, with Hubble, thanks to Hubble, on uh, the Uranus magnetosphere, which was very intriguing because uh, uh, Uranus oral, oral emissions and magnetosphere could only be uh, investigated once during the flyby of the planet by the Voyager 2 spacecraft in 1986. So we could study that magnetosphere and oral processes only with a few hours of measurements uh, acquired by Voyager 2 along its trajectory. But then we knew that uh, Uranus was uh, magnetized and displayed oral emissions. And by uh, calculating the, the theoretical brightness of these emissions, we found that it should, be, uh, uh, it should fit the, the minimum threshold, detection threshold of HST. So we recently tried to, uh, to catch uh, these emissions again. And uh, to do that, instead of, um, so this had been done uh, twice in two decades, as for Uranus, but always uh, with negative detections. And instead of observing randomly, this time we tried to take benefit of a property we just mentioned, which is the interaction between solar wind and uh, the, the magnetic field of a planet. Because we mentioned this very briefly, but one property of the Earth, uh, Saturn, and so by extra, ex extrapolating uh, this uh, to Uranus and Neptune, one property of this magnetosphere is to react to a, a strong compression uh, of the solar wind reaching this planet. So at the Earth, this is called as the substorm phenomena, um, and which, which gave rise to the space weather uh, discipline. Uh, when a compression arrives at Earth, the magnetosphere is compressed, and then there is some of uh, acceleration processes that are forced because of that com uh, compressed uh, magnetosphere. And this gives rise to very uh, bright uh, auras, right? And so uh, to try to catch Uranus auras, we uh, uh, made the assumption that Uranus may react as, uh, as the Earth does. And so we observed during the pass of a series of uh, coronal mass ejection, which were propagating uh, in the outer heliosphere uh, along, the, along the planets until reaching Uranus. And then thanks to Hubble, we could observe at the right place at the right time, and we got a, a detection, uh, a picture of which I, Scott may be able to show you. Right ahead of you. I'm really glad you talked about this because I was going to ask about this of it of the cascading through the solar system and you being able to watch you know the mass ejection then comes to Earth and etc. So that's very interesting that you can kind of watch it propagate and then find a really faint signature. Yeah, so sure. Great. And, and as far as I'm concerned, that was one of the most uh, uh, surprising results we got thanks to these uh, marvelous measurements. So coronal mass ejections are these magnetic eruptions from the sun. They're, so they can be enormous, and they, they go out uh, throughout the solar system with uh, uh, a lot of very uh, primarily electrons and, and things going along with it. Uh, and when they hit these planets, then, it looks like you can see the signatures of the, as you said, the compression of the atmosphere and these auroral emissions. Mm -hmm. um, net can we talk about Neptune for a minute? I, if I, I may be screwing this up, but I remember I think when Voyager two went by, they were seeing these white bands on Neptune. Am I remembering correctly? And they were these. It was in the upper atmosphere of Neptune, and I was wondering if those were auroral uh, emissions or not. Uh, Voyager fly by Neptune. Voyager two fly by Neptune in 1989, and as for the other planets, uh, its UV spectrometer looked carefully at the upper atmosphere of the planet and actually tentatively detected aurora, but they are very, very faint and close to the detection threshold. So even this uh, claimed detection is not uh, confirmed yet. So okay. what, we, what we did for Uranus could certainly be reapplied for ne Neptune, except that uh, Neptune is, is much farther from the Sun and uh, supposedly displays a fainter array. So we are really at the limit of what uh, Hubble can do uh, with the uh, oral emissions of the planets of the solar system. 
Okay, Charles Bell has got a couple of really good questions for us on the Q&A app. Let me start with his first one. Um, he, he's asking, have you studied the hydrogen coma via Lyman alpha emission from Venus using the Soho Swan images? Soho Swan, I'm not sure what that is. No, I didn't. Um, so what uh, these, um, um, uh, how, uh, how is his name? Uh, Charles Bell? Charles Bell. Charles Bell. Bell. What Charles is uh, uh, referring to is the fact that um, when Venus is uh, um, uh, swamped into the solar wind, it possesses uh, uh, an induced magnetosphere because the plasma cannot uh, uh, pass through the planet and so it passes on the edges and uh, it creates what we call an induced magnetosphere or a coma. And um, this type of magnetosphere has completely different properties as the permanent magnetosphere we just discussed. And in particular, it does not display any uh, powerful plasma acceleration process which could trigger oral emissions. So I have not studied Venus at all. I would like to, perhaps in some, uh, uh, at some occasion, but uh, because uh, Venus is not a primary candidate for displaying these emissions. Okay. Uh, good question, Charles. Thank you. Um, Soho Swan. I'm trying to think. I thought I knew Soho. I don't recall a instrument on there called that. But um, he's got one more question. Let me just go ahead and get this out because this is also related. Have you used NASA SWIFT um, ultraviolet optical telescope for planetary aurora? This is also from Charles. So SWIFT uh, is a plane, right? I'm not sure. Maybe Carol, you may help me. Uh, I think that uh, this refers to a plane which possesses a telescope uh, and uh, so. able to observe at uh, the highest uh, altitudes of the Earth's atmosphere. This but is some I... mixed mode question because SWIFT is an X ray burster. Yeah, I think it's light. So I'm not I mean, sure about a UV optical telescope um, above the atmosphere other than Hubble. Um, so I'm not sure what we're referring to, but SWIFT looks in the X-ray. Okay. okay. All right, so I guess I, and it doesn't sound like you've used it for that. So uh, good question, though. Thank you, Charles. Um, one more from Adam Synergy, who's got a, who's got a good question. He is, he's also asking from the Q&A app. He, this is Adam asking, would we see these bright emissions in a planet containing only layers of metallic hydrogen and helium, or... Is there is this more evidence of an iron core inside Jupiter? Well, um, so how to answer? Repeat the question, please. Could you repeat the what question? Would we see these bright emissions in a planet containing only layers of metallic hydrogen and helium, or is this more evidence of an iron core inside Jupiter? Uh, the fact is that uh, these emissions are produced at the uppermost of the atmosphere and this does not consist of uh, metallic hydrogen. Metallic hydrogen is rather found at the core of the planet. So this is a, a different layer of, of the planet which, which cannot be impacted by these particles which are stopped by pressure much, at much higher altitudes. Does okay. it make sense? Yes, right, is. and so and so uh, so. Let me comment: is that the aurora phenomena, the fact that it is related to the magnetic field? One can look at each planet and say, what is it that generates the magnetic field in the core of that object? And in the case of the Earth, it is uh, partly an iron core. In the other planets, especially the outer planets, which are largely gaseous, it may be a different phenomenon. Okay. So, um, the uh, magnetic field itself, although Laurent can correct me because I'm not an expert, but I think the existence of the magnetic field just says that there is something causing the magnetic field in the, in the core. It may not necessarily be um, iron, you know, ferrous or anything. It's just something that is capable of generating a magnetic field. Uh, Go ahead, Laurent. Sorry, uh, no, just, to, just to, to briefly mention that uh, we think, because we are unsure, we, we, we never were able to go into the, the deep core of a planet, but uh, we think that uh, planetary magnetic fields are produced by a dynamo effect, which is driven by the motion of uh, some dense uh, plasma, so either uh, uh, metallic hydrogen or, or, um, or deeper, enfin, uh, lighter ions, uh, for instance in Mercury, which are uh, um, having uh, some uh, uh, convection uh, motion driven by the rotation of the planet, which then give rise to, uh, to, um, to a magnetic field. Okay. 
Uh, so I've got uh, a couple things here real quick too. Uh, the Swan instrument on Soho is the Solar Wind and right. Tropies. So that is a collaboration with the Finnish Meteorological Institute. So that is an instrument that's on Soho. And I have a question from Twitter from Summer Ash. I was wondering with the interactions with the natural satellites of Jupiter on the Aurora, is our moon interacting at all with our Aurora that we're seeing on Earth? So actually, no, our moon is not interacting at all. Uh, I mean, electrodynamically speaking, with the Earth, because the, the condition for a satellite to uh, interact with the planet is first that the satellite uh, moves uh, into the magnetosphere, so it sees permanently a magnetic field uh, passing in front uh, of, it, of it. And second, the satellite shall possess a conductive exosphere, which is the condition for these uh, gigantic electrical uh, currents to, to close, actually, along the field lines and then uh, at the satellite. So without a conductive exosphere, uh, this electric interaction cannot, uh, cannot uh, give rise. So unfortunately, at the Earth, question, uh, the, the Moon does not possess, possess a conductive exosphere and actually passes half of its time uh, um, out of the magnetosphere so that an Io-Jupiter uh, interaction cannot be, uh, cannot be observed at Earth. That's a great question. Thank you for that. Uh, Charles also wants to point out, Charles Bell points out that the SWIFT has both X-ray and UV optical telescopes on board. Uh, and apparently, um, as you... so. I don't. I don't think they're being used right now in the, in the way that that Laurent is is uh, is studying things. So, uh, but thanks for that, Charles. We appreciate it. Okay, so Swift, uh, Swift is primarily to look at at galactic burst burst things. They don't, in general, look at um, the solar system. And in the case of um, Soho, Soho is specifically to look at the sun. So it can tell you when there's a burst or, you know, an emission from the sun, but it's not going to turn around and look at Jupiter in response to that. Right. So um, then, one more. Go ahead. Do you want to say something to that? Yeah, I just wanted to add that I retrieved the name of the plane I was thinking to by uh, discussing uh, Swift, uh, which is called uh, Sophia, actually. Sophia is a... Uh, oh, Sophia, yes. But, which is a German US plane with uh, some telescopes on board which are able to observe uh, at very high altitudes and which possesses a UV telescope but it is too uh, deep in the atmosphere to be able to observe uh, either uh, Earth's aurora or the outer planets. Here's this one also from the Q&A app from Alodi Arguello um, and I think I'm gonna I hope I get this right. Is it unusual to have auroras in the Sun and if not, what would be the consequences? So I think I'm reading that right. Uh, can you have aurora in the solar corona? To get That's nothing but a charged particle <laughs> bath, isn't it? I mean, <laughs> there's nothing but a plasma up there. Well, certainly not the auroras that we are used to see uh, at the atmosphere because the medium is not the same. The solar corona is very hot, very uh, charged, and this is completely different from the neutral atmosphere we were dealing with. But so if we leave optical uh, emissions, I think there are some possibilities for the sun to uh, drive uh, radio emissions because radio emissions only need um, a tenuous plasma uh, with uh, energetic electrons gyrating around magnetic field lines. So this can, uh, this can arrive around magnetized planets, but this may arrive as well uh, around the sun. Yeah, so the, 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 the corona... Sorry, uh, I, I missed you. The sound was cut off. Oh, you're dropping out, Tony. I am. Oh, uh, so uh, the the environment of the solar corona is a much different environment than the uh, than the uh, uh, than what we're talking about here for planetary atmospheres. When when I was working in car, one of the uh, senior scientists would ask, love to ask the question, how can we have the sun, which is 5,500 degrees Kelvin? Uh, why can we, how can we have a two million degree uh, Kelvin uh, a two million degree corona? He used to love to answer that question, and and it's a, the answer is rather intriguing. I mean, it's just a very thin, very dense, a very thin uh, atmosphere. However, it's very, very hot, and it's really a unique 
environment uh, up up in the sun. But I don't think when you think of the atmosphere of a sun, you think of it as the same way as you would a planet. So, but that that is a good question, though. Thank you very much. Um, okay, Carol, let's get to one here that's been sitting here. This is uh, from. Uh, 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 Christian uh, Timote, I think I'm pronouncing yeah. it right. What is the expected life of the Hubble Space Telescope? Well, it's a good question. Um, so right now, everything on Hubble is operational. Uh, everything that was operational on the last servicing mission in 2009 is in operation today. Um, there is part one part of the advanced camera for surveys which hasn't worked and was unable to be fixed, but everything else is working fine, and that includes not only instrumentation but the batteries, the computers, the solar cells, and there are redundant systems as well. The pointing systems are redundant. So a few of the gyros have had some difficulty, and engineers watch the performance of all of these instruments as well as all of the satellite components. And as far as we can tell, except for a couple of the gyros that have exhibited some noise and one failure, everything is, operate, is operating fine. So as long as it operates fine, um, it can last a long time. And um, in particular, we are looking for, you now. we're on our 25th anniversary year. We just celebrated the 24th. Um, we, we believe we astronomers believe and some of the engineers believe it's going to last until 2020 but it could last a lot well beyond that and the reason that we're interested in having it last at least until 2020 is because we would like two years overlap with the James Webb telescope which um, launches in 2018 right it, which is launches in 2018 but um, you know it's constantly being monitored and it looks healthy so it's like any other system you monitor your car every day and you do the readings and oil analysis and ch check your tire pressure and things seem to be running we can't maintain it anymore but it's gonna run and run and run until some major component fails yeah, um, if everything goes really well as Carol is, 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 is outlining all the stuff keeps working then the limiting factor becomes the orbit it's in, and I think, if I'm not mistaken, Carol, that is decide that will be decided sometime around 2028. Uh, it'll start to have problems with its orbit, and we may have to take correct corrective action by then, uh, yeah. somehow. Yeah. So, right. so that's the ultimate. The ultimate date will be 2028, uh, yeah. sometime. Uh, yeah. it, even if it's all working perfectly. So, uh, but. So far, I mean, this telescope has <laughs> exceeded expectations at every turn from the very beginning on up. And I want to point out, while we're on this topic, that Carol and Scott and I are planning a history of Hubble Hangout sometime in September where we're going to talk about Hubble. Nothing but Hubble, what it's done, its hist what it's been through, how we fixed it, what it's, what it's gone through. So look for that also in September. I was also going to comment that it's interesting because the lifetime of Hubble is a little bit linked to what Laurent is talking about because with the emissions from the sun that can puff up the atmosphere of the earth um, as well as produce aurora and depending on how the atmosphere inflates or doesn't inflate it can produce drag. Um, if it puffs up enough it produces drag on the telescope which can then cause the orbit to decay. So the 2028 I think is a conservative estimate of the the extension of the atmosphere and how much it will inf influence the orbit of Hubble. Excellent point. I mean it doesn't it doesn't take into account all the variations that can happen with space weather and things like that. People forget that Hubble is while it is in orbit it's still kind of in the atmosphere of the Earth so yeah. it is affected by that a little bit. Uh, and, and Jacques Daramont uh, that also answers your questions. How long uh, time remainder for the mission for Hubble. I think we pretty much uh, covered that part there. Uh, Scott, am I missing anything? Is it? I do have some from Twitter as well. Okay. Uh, Go, where so in Twitter this, are you looking? They're not using Hubble Hangout. No, where it's you, communicating back and forth with me now from a thread. So oh, you're in charge of. Uh, I'm uh, driving uh, the internet, Tony. You've uh, known this you, for a while. I know that about. I know. I should know better. <laughs> so <laughs> it, it's actually follow-ups from summer. I was wondering, is Callisto too far out to interact in that way with Jupiter? And also, are there any natural satellites interacting with Saturn's aurora? So uh, as for Jupiter, the, the interaction between Callisto and Jupiter has been guessed for a long time ago. And to my knowledge, there has only been uh, one possible detection 
uh, by a colleague of Boston, uh, which is unpublished yet. So if any interaction, this at least shows that this shall be very transient. So Callisto shall have a, a different uh, type of interaction with respect to the other Galilean satellites, probably a less conductive exosphere. And as for Saturn, uh, the Cassini mission uh, recently discovered that uh, Enceladus is uh, behaving as Io does um, uh, with Jupiter and as Enceladus with Saturn, which means that Enceladus is producing a footprint in oral emissions. And you may see this on the picture that, was, uh, that you may have in hands, uh, Scott. Uh, yeah, which I'll get up here in just a second which displays actually a picture of Saturn. We, we did not speak about Saturn yet. Uh, and you, you see there uh, these marvelous um, uh, pictures taken by Hubble, where you see the, the very variable nature of these oral emissions. In particular, the, the bright one at the middle was produced by a solar wind compression reaching the, the planet. So this is an illustration. And on the following picture, uh, this is a figure that was taken by the Cassini UV spectroimager, and which reveals actually a spot uh, which is linked to, uh, no, not that one, a spot uh, uh, which, which is linked to Enceladus exactly as, uh, uh, as for Io. So, and the fact, the interest with Cassini, the, the, the main advantage of Cassini was that, it was that we could, we were able to get in situ measurements and so, so that's uh, that picture. You see that uh, when the spacecraft was crossing the flux tube uh, relating Enceladus to, uh, to Saturn, it was able to, uh, to, to acquire in situ measurements of uh, plasma uh, traveling uh, along these field lines, and then remotely observe with a UV uh, telescope the, the rural context on the, the surface of on the atmosphere of the planet. And so with this set of measurements, we got these two informations, both remotely and in situ, and we could uh, diagnose the full uh, electric uh, current, which is coupling Enceladus to its uh, host planet. All right, great. Thank you. Uh, so we're running out of time, and I, I want to I want to thank uh, Laurent Lamy for uh, joining us and uh, talking about Planetary Aurora. He's from the Observatory of Paris in Moudon. Thank you, Laurent. I appreciate your time today. Yeah. Great. So before. And before I go, I just want to I want to highlight one comment from YouTube um, that is uh, say this is from uh, George Lloyd who goes hi Tony Carol and Scott I'm a subscriber of Deep Astronomy Space Fan News and have just stumbled onto this channel I was wondering how do I find out when other live hangouts happen and the reason I wanted to highlight that is he goes I never know when they're on and would maybe like to ask a question live. Well, Lloyd, the best way to find out is to is to you subscribe to this channel, which is your first step. You'll get that notification when it goes live. Uh, we all if you also follow Hubble Telescope and Deep Astronomy and and Scientific Scott on Twitter, you'll be able to get what we are constantly uh, letting people know. And finally, yeah, I don't shut up. I'm always tweeting. <laughs> I, know, boy, I know, and so the uh, so that's that's another great way to find out about when we're having these. Also, Carol, uh, Scott, and I are being very you know we're working on a schedule that is that is uh, we're going to be doing these for the most part every single Thursday at three p.m. Eastern, which in the UK is seven o'clock your time. So um, I, so that's the the best way to find out about when. And these another are happening. another thing I'll mention: if you Google Hubble Hangouts, you will find the web page that often has what the next topic. Is yes. Um, we might take a little vacation at the end of August, but um, mostly it'll be every Thursday at three, unless our guest absolutely cannot be with us at that time, and then we'll reschedule it. But we are Wait, trying to have them vacation? weekly. We uh, have no, you are not. Oh, I didn't say okay. anything about you. That's right. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> So uh, that's it for this week, folks. Um, next week we are we are going to be having a hangout with some of the people with the institute uh, on the process of decide. We're going to talk about how do you get to use Hubble. What's it like? What do you got to go through to get Hubble time? Loren knows because he's had to go through it yeah, successfully. Uh, we're talk with members of the time allocation committee, and we're going to talk about how one goes about getting uh, Hubble time. How what how is it decided? What Hubble looks at. 
one of the things that I like, you know, people I think have a little misconception of what Hubble, Hubble is about as general purpose a telescope as you're going to find in space, but it was really designed to look for dim, warm things. And so very, very dim things are what it, what it's, what it excels at. So that's what we're going to be talking about that next week. Um, on behalf of Carol Christian, Scott Lewis, and Lord, Dr. Lauren Lamy, I would like to thank you all for watching. And as always, keep looking up. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Good night.